evening. If you open your Bibles to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. We are in Isaiah 22. So stick your finger in Isaiah 22. But we are going to preface this chapter. There is a great parallel between this proverb and the section we're going to read tonight. Is Isaiah 22 is about the nation. And quite frankly, Proverbs 29 is really about any nation. And we're going to see quite a few parallels here. So Proverbs 29, and mom will be happy, I'm reading from the King James. Four Proverbs, Isaiah will be in the ESV. He that, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people rejoice. Mourn. Whoso loveth wisdom rejoiceth his father, but he that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. The king by judgment establishes the land, but he that receiveth gift overthrow it. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. In the transgression of the evil man there is a snare. But the righteous doth sing and rejoice. The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turneth, turn away wrath. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool uttereth all his mind, but the wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. If a ruler hearkeneth to lies, all his servants are wicked. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both, lighteneth both their eyes. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. The rod and the reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. And then chapter, in verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now if you'll turn over to Isaiah 22. But just keep in the back of your mind this proverb. We're going to see fulfillment of all these things in this chapter, though we're not going to dive into them deeply. Keep those in your mind, and you will see them unfold before you. As you're turning over to Isaiah 22, this is my first in-depth study of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is often quoted in many messages. My father quoted from it this morning. We see Isaiah just woven through the entire Bible as it's often quoted in the New Testament. And although I've read through the book of Isaiah and I've listened through the book of Isaiah, this is my very first time actually doing a deep dive study of the book of Isaiah. And to be quite frank, I found this book to be very challenging. Challenging in two senses of the word. Challenging to make sure that we are gaining the proper understanding of the interpretation of the scripture or its intended meaning. But also I found this challenging in a sense that it challenges me or urges me forward in my Christian life. As we've looked 
beyond interpretation and look to application, which is what we do with Scripture. We've uncovered many applications. Applications to us as a nation in the United States of America. Applications to each one of us individually as believers. And applications for spiritual warfare. As we know, there is a spiritual war going on today. As we look at this book, and this book is biblical prophecy. And we've gone through all the minor prophets, and now we are traveling through the major prophets. There is one important rule to make sure that we are gaining the proper interpretation. Because application cannot be made without first understanding the proper interpretation. One vital rule that we must come to if we're going to ever understand biblical prophecy. And this is given to us in Revelation 19.10. And this is an angel speaking to John. And John, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. I am thy brethren. And I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And here is our key. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is an, a vital key for going to gain the proper interpretation. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's our guiding principle. It is bringing us to the correct understanding, the correct interpretation, and therefore to the proper application. That all prophecy points to Jesus. Whether it is he as creator, whether it is he as the suffering servant, or if it is he as the final king. So if you open to Isaiah 22. An oracle concerning Jerusalem. An oracle concerning the valley of vision. Now we know this to be Jerusalem. It's called the Valley of Vision. And it is called this for many reasons. Many of the prophets, they prophesied concerning or at or around Jerusalem. It was the capital city of the Judean kingdom. And therefore it set the direction for the kingdom. And I would say it's even farther than that. I've been to Frankfurt, and when you're in Frankfurt, you have this feeling that you're at the capital of Kentucky. And when we drove to Dulles Airport and we were near D.C., there's this feeling that you are near the capital of the United States of America when you're in D.C., and I've had the honor to visit Jerusalem. And I can tell you that the feeling is more than that this is just the capital of Israel. But you really feel that this is the capital of the world. Also, Jerusalem was the Valley of Vision because this is where the temple was. Not only did it set the direction for the kingdom civilly, it also contained the temple and therefore set the direction spiritually for the nation. And as Solomon dedicated the capital or the temple, he dedicated stating that this is where all men will come to worship God. It sets that direction. This is why this is the valley of vision. Continuing on in verse 1. What do you mean that you have gone up, all of you, to the housetops? You who are full of shouting, tumultuous city, exalted town. You're slain or not slain with the sword, or you're dead in battle. All your leaders have fled together without a bow. They were captured. All you who were found were captured, though they had fled away. They were throwing a party. 
We just had our Memorial Day picnic last week. And Memorial Day, all throughout our nation, there are grill outs. There's weenie roastings, grilling of hamburgers and steaks. There's music, there's celebration all throughout our nation. And why is this? Because we as Americans celebrate this because we have heroes. There were warriors fought in battle. People slain for our freedom. The slogan that is often quoted around Memorial Day is that all gave some and some gave all. In our celebration, we express this happiness and this joy that we have freedom in the United States. We are happy and we express our happiness because we have life. And we express our happiness and joy in our grill outs and cookouts and parties because we have liberty. Yet also, in this celebration, we're also expressing our mourning for those who gave their lives for our country. Mourning for the cost of liberty, life, and freedom. Our Memorial Day picnic was in stark contrast that was happening here in, in Jerusalem. The leaders were cowards. The soldiers dropped their weapons and they watch their fellow countrymen led away and while all this is going on in Jerusalem around the city of Jerusalem what's happening in Jerusalem they're throwing a party they're shouting on their housetops in celebration who throws a party in remembrance of generals that flee in battle who throws a party to remember armies that retreat? Who would throw a party when their friends, cousins, family members, brothers and sisters are captured and being led away? Verse 4. Therefore I said, look away from me. Let me weep bitter tears. Do not labor or comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughters, the daughter of my people. The sight of this party going on in Jerusalem after this was happening, it was sad. It was concerning. It was painful to see. It was like a parent seeing a grown child making bad decisions. Verse 5, for the Lord God of hosts has a day of torment and trampling and confusion in the valley of vision. A battering down of walls and a shouting to the mountains. And Elam bore the quiver with chariots and horsemen and Kerr uncovered the shield. Your choicest valleys were full of chariots and your horsemen took their stand at the gates. And he's taken away the covering of Judah. And now, the people that were having this party, they're starting to notice that the city is surrounded. To every party, there is an end. And partying is only a temporary happiness. And after the last song, after the picnic's over, reality sinks in. In that day, you looked up to the weapons of the house of the forest, and you saw that the breaches in the city of David were many. You collected the waters of the lower pool, and you counted the houses of Jerusalem, and you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. You made a reservoir between the two walls for water of the old pool. But you did not look to him who did it or see him who planned it long ago. 
Now that the party is over, panic is setting in. They're looking to the forest for weapons to fight. They're saving even their sewer, bath water, for water to drink. They're tearing down their houses to hold up the city walls. God was sending a message, but no one was listening. I'd like to ask, when we face trials and battles in our lives, is this our response? Do we pick up sticks to fight people with swords? Do we go out and drink out of the bath water in the toilet for our water? Do we tear down our whole house and homes to build up a wall? It's kind of like selling your car to buy gas money. Or do we do the call that was here? Do we realize that maybe God is sending in us a message? And are we listening and looking to him? Verse 12, in that day, the Lord God of hosts calling, called for weeping and mourning, for baldness and wearing of sackcloth, and behold, joy and gladness, killing of oxen and slaughtering of sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The Lord of hosts has revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity will not be atoned for you until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. Paul quotes verse 13 in 1 Corinthians 15.32 where he says, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beasts of Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? Let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. God's judgments are given that we would repent. And that's what he's calling for us here, calling for Jerusalem here, is to repent But Jerusalem is throwing a party. They're in a state of denial, getting but the last bit of joy that they have. There are trials on every side. All their protectors, their armies, their generals, they've given up. And instead of looking to the Savior, they look for one small bit left of happiness and throw a party. Verse 15, thus says the Lord God of hosts, come, go to the steward, to Shebnan, who is over the household, and say to him, what have you to do here, and whom have you here, that you have cut out here a tomb for yourself? You who cut out a tomb on the height and the carve, a dwelling for yourself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently, O you strong man. He will seize firm hold on you and whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There you shall die, and there shall be your glorious chariots. You shame of your master's house. I will thrust you from your office and I will pull you down from your station. In that day I will call on my servant Eliakim, the son of Helikim, and I will clothe him with your robe and I will bind your sash on him and I will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be like a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulders the key to the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg and secure, in a secure place. And he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him the whole honor of his father's house. The offspring and the issue, every small vessel from cups to all the flagons. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg 
that was fastened in a secure place will give way and it will be cut down and fall and the load that was on it will be cut off for the Lord has spoken. And we do have an, a messianic example here of Eliakim pointing to Jesus. But we also see here that there are those that believe they have strength and those that believe that they can save themselves and not put their faith into God and not seek Him. And all of them that trust in their strength will be brought down. So as we've looked at the interpretation, we see here tonight that God brings judgments on those who trust in themselves. And that when we face trials, self-trust is like battling a stick against a sword. It's like drinking toilet water. It is like selling your car for gas money. When we face trials, there's a tendency to enter into denial as they did here in Jerusalem and throw a party when it's time to repent. But now let's also discuss application tonight. Jerusalem here was called the Valley of Vision and it's not meant to be a cute name. The sin here of the city of Jerusalem, their sin that they were, was not the party. The sin here, the root cause, was they lost their vision. And as we read at the beginning of our service tonight, where there is no vision, the people perish. And although we can see in every proverb that we read tonight, we can see how it has played out here in this chapter. But it is verse 18 of Proverbs 29 that we see most vivid. The loss of vision. If you're not living in the vision that God has provided for you, you are truly living in sin. And what is vision? The visions of the prophets, they were direction for the people. They were the guidance to the people. They were calls to action. And they were to act upon these visions. A vision without action, without moving towards our goal. In business, they said, a vision without traction is really just a hallucination. So as we go, let's make sure our vision is clear. And let's make sure that we're moving towards our vision, not just having a hallucination. When trials happen, they are just indications that we need to reevaluate. Are we working towards the vision God has put before us. Our efforts will not help without following God's direction, His vision for us. Parties can only bring temporary happiness. But what happens after the party? Are we celebrating out of denial? as Jerusalem was, or out of reality as we did during our Memorial Day picnic for those that gave their lives for our nation? Are we celebrating the victory of our vision? The vision that God has put before us. If a fish has a vision that he wants to be in the air like a bird, and he tries to go out into the air. He cannot find happiness there. 
If a bird tries to be, have a vision and to go under the water as a fish, there is no happiness there. Our happiness is found only when we're living within the vision that God has prepared for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Apply these thoughts to our hearts in Jesus' name.